That's the truth, isn't it? That is the hard truth. Well, let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll get started. We're on page 139, uh, chapter 10, message 10, the minor prophets post-exile. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you once again for the gift of this day, especially on this uh, Trinity Sunday, for the wonderful love that has been expressed uh, through you, Father, and your Son, and communicated to us by the power and promise of your Spirit. And uh, we especially thank you that you not only described what would happen to your Son, but also the outpouring of the Spirit in the Old Testament, uh, pointing to the uh, this Pentecostal season in our day. We just ask, Lord, that you'd allow your message to continue to go both Jew and Gentile, that the power of the gospel might be shared here and around the world. Bless us with that power today as we consider your word and are, are encouraged and guided and strengthened by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor, I just made a mistake. Oh, you're right. We're, we're actually in chapter nine. Yep. Chapter it's the minor prophets, the first of the minor prophets. So it's Hosea, Amos, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. So one of the ways that you, one of the problems with the Bible is that you do not have a, uh, so we're on page 131. Uh, you do not have the Bible in, in chronological order. Now you can buy a Bible like that. You know, because there's Bibles for everything. And there's a chronological order Bible. Um, the, you know, and that's one of the challenges also with the Gospels in the New Testament is that they're not necessarily from book to book in the exact same chronological order. And, um, some I include some other things that the others don't. And, and, um, uh, and, and so it's, it's sometimes a little bit of a challenge if you've ever read the harmony of the Gospels to know exactly where in Jesus' life certain stories fit because the Gospel writers don't always give us a lot of contextual clues about that. Now with the writers uh, uh, of the minor uh, prophets, you have uh, some that are pre-exile, just as you do in the major prophets. You've got people like... Uh, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah that are at the beginning of the captivity. Uh, you've got Ezekiel who's present when um, the people are taken into captivity, especially a lot of his is there, Jeremiah just the end of his prophecy. You've got people like Daniel who are all in the captivity. They're living in Babylon and, and it's from there that they write their, their, their book. Um, and so you have the same thing that you have in the major prophets with the minor prophets. You've got those that are pre-exile and those that are post-exile. Um, and you have to sometimes ask too, uh, which of the two nations are they prophesying to? Because some are prof prophets in the northern kingdom of Israel, others are prophets in the southern kingdom of Judah. And the northern kingdom of Israel is, uh, was defeated earlier than the southern kingdom in Judah. So putting all that in your timeline, is kind of important, and so I, uh, I like the study Bibles that have a timeline to them so that you can see kind of where each of the prophets fits. I know in the, in, in the NIV study Bible that I use, uh, uh, they have a timeline at the very front of it. Unfortunately, mine's pretty well worn, so the pages are falling, falling out. Um, but it gives you uh, the outline of the history, and then also uh, when most likely those different prophets were uh, prophesying. So you've got pre-exilic and post-exilic um, uh, prophecies. And so let's, uh, let's start then with the pre-exilic uh, prophets. And uh, again, anything you read here that maybe sticks out at you, you've got uh, Hosea and you've got Jonah. You got Amos and Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. Um, so he starts, the first one that he cites is the one in Hosea, um, which is a typical prophecy. Did 
to say what? You know the story of Hosea? He marries an adulteress. And then later on, he's going to go and redeem her. He's got to pay a ransom price in order to get her back. Even though she has continued to be unfaithful, he um, pays the cost of her redemption. And so you've got not, and, and again, the difference between a, a rectilinear prophecy is one that says this is what's going to happen. Uh, typical prophecy paints a picture. And both kinds of prophecies are found in the Old Testament. For instance, comparing Jesus as uh, we do back in uh, the life of Abraham to Isaac. You know, it doesn't ever say that Jesus is going to be like Isaac any place in the Bible. But you've got the only son of a father who is carrying wood up a mountain, Mount Moriah, which is one of the two twin peaks in Jerusalem. And, um, and he's to be the sacrifice. And you say, wait a minute, there's too many pieces that are coincidental to be coincidental. So you see types of Jesus like that pictures, a lot of the pictures and the um, feasts. So the Day of Atonement, the scapegoat, the bull and the goat that are... It, now there we do have some um, writing in the book of Hebrews that points back to that and say, well, that was really pointing to Christ. But of course, the people then, there's no passage in the Old Testament that says the Messiah is going to be like the scapegoat. Later on, reflecting, the writer of the Hebrews says uh, that's one of the images of, of the Christ. And, and so Hosea, the first one that he mentions, is one of those kind of typical prophecies. The second one is Amos. And Amos, it really details their sins. So if you turn to the book of, of Amos, this again is a time when God is uh, calling on Israel to return to following God's will and God's way. Amos again is not a man of the court, but he's uh, a shepherd. Which remember we said last time is kind of a type of the Messiah as well, a shepherd king like David, a shepherd prophet like Amos, or a shepherd prophet like Moses. If you turn to the book of Amos, let's go there first, um, and, and, and just see what kind of things he's taking them to task on and for. Um, so the, you'll find it in chapter 2, starting with verse 6. Somebody want to read uh, verses 6 to 8? This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken it as fines. So remember that when God had commanded in the Old Testament that if you're going to lend some money to somebody, you're not supposed to get security. But they were doing it. 
And here he mentions especially something as paltry as a pair of sandals that might have been taken in security for a loan, but they'll sell them for, or the clothes they're lying down on, they're talking about the whatever they're laying on here, is something that they took in pledge. It would have been a pledge for a loan and um, was not repaid. So then, you know, think about a pawn shop, right? Um, Why were they not supposed to take security? The idea is that God has given you everything. And he doesn't ask any security from you. So when you're dealing this was just especially with fellow Israelites, you're not supposed to take any security. They could, see somebody who was an Israelite who had land, they could sell you that land. But then every 50 years was a year of jubilee when you had to give back the land to the original owners. It was a year of freedom, and it was every 50 years. So it was a long time. You could, if you needed money, you could sell your land, but uh, eventually it would come back to your family. You might not be alive to see it. You think about it in their day and age with the lifespans they had. But eventually it has to come back to the family. He takes them to the task down in verses 11 and 12 for something else. Somebody want to read those verses for us? And also raised up prophets from among your sons, the Nazarites from among your young men. Is this not true, people of Israel, declares the Lord? But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. You commanded the Nazarites to drink wine, in other words, to break their, their promise. So he didn't respect the vows of others who had made, set themselves apart for the Lord. And so he's got this word of judgment um, on Israel. What, what is the time frame on this? This is the pre... Um, this is pre-exile. This is pre-exile. <coughs> Whoops. And it's pre-exile for Israel. Remember, Israel goes into... Uh, Captivity. I want to say it's 49. Let me just double check. So, so where does this fit with Jeremiah? Fall of the Northern Kingdom happens in 722. Jeremiah is well after the fall of the Kingdom of Israel. The fall of Jeremiah doesn't come in, but remember he prophesies to the Southern Kingdom. He's in Jerusalem. This is Israel. This is the Northern Kingdom. Okay. And Jonah and Amos and Hosea especially are prophesying to the northern kingdom. There's overlap between Hosea in the northern kingdom and Isaiah in the southern kingdom. So they're prophesying a little bit at the same time. No, the, the only reason I ask is because in verse 12 where he says, um, command his prophets saying you shall not prophesy, that's, uh, that, I think that's a Jeremiah. No, but that was to the southern okay, kingdom. Okay. This is to the northern kingdom. And so this is uh, at least 100 years before Jeremiah. Okay. And, and, and the, I mean, the transgressions that he's describing, you know, they're very, I mean, they're, they're very consistent. With the southern kingdom, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, as a result, um, if you turn to uh, 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 chapter 5, it's a woe to you for the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a common uh, phrase for some kind of judgment from God. And what is he, what is, what, what's the reason why this judgment is coming? Somebody want to read verses uh, 21 uh, to 24. These are the last verse especially are some very famous words. I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. <clears throat> Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. 
Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Where have you heard that last verse before? There's a song about that. <laughs> <laughs> A celebrated civil rights activist. Oh, if you ever um, listen to Dr. Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream, mm -hmm. this is one of the passages that he cites. And you can see maybe a little bit why, when you look at some of the sins of the nation of Israel, they were taking advantage of the poor. And what God is saying is, <clears throat> you know, um, I want to see you not just talk the talk, I want to see you walk the walk. And that's why it disgusts me that you think that everything's okay. And, uh, I, I think if, if you um, especially listen to civil rights leaders in, in the African American church, they really draw on the Old Testament prophets. and the Old Testament imagery because they see themselves as having endured some of the same injustices as those who were poor in Israel. So, you know, the, what do they call it? Um, is it redlining? You know, trying to keep people out of a certain population or area. You know, and, and you can do that in a number of ways. You can do that by well, price, pricing them. Yeah. Red, red, redlining is where is where like the insurance industry would say we're not going to sell insurance if you live if you in, live in this area. This area. Yep. Yeah. And realtors would you know yeah. divert people and yep. Neighbor next, next door a few years ago was on vacation. It's a joke. His teenage son put a for sale sign in front of the house. Oh my! And um, when he got home, he saw the sign. Ha ha! Took the sign down. Two days later, a black gentleman is knocking on his door. Wants to look at the house. Okay, and he says, "House is not for sale." And this guy got really. Because yeah. he assumed there was a racial thing, not a. It was a racial thing, so there's redlining. But that, you know, and that was quite common that people would, yeah. you know, yeah. not in my backyard, not in my neighborhood. And um, if you know the history of Milwaukee, you know that this northwestern corridor has a lot of rental apartment units, and those were built with the city father's knowledge to try to push the. African American um, people out of the central city and out toward the northwest. So, you know, it, it, it's happened in our own locality. It's what uh, what often uh, still happens, although very surreptitiously. You know, Mequon, uh, they don't have to do any of that kind of stuff because uh, a number of years back they passed a rule that said you had to buy five acres in order to build a house. Yeah. Well, five acres of land in Mequon is going to price <laughs> most of us out of the yeah. market, yeah. you know? Um, so there are all kinds of ways that uh, you, can, you can do that. And, of course, that's one of the things that people often say. If you're a person of color and you're driving through a particular area, you're like, more likely to get stopped by the cops and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's just, it's a part of what happens in our society. I think less so now, because people are more hypersensitive to it. I think one of the challenges still is that a lot of, especially person-on-person -person crime still happens, uh, although it's very often black-on-black -black or Hispanic-on-Hispanic -on -Hispanic or white-on-white -white for that matter. Most people don't steal from people or kill people who are well, not somehow connected. You're, you're familiar with the talk, right, that every black father gives to his sons. Oh, 
police yeah. where it's when you get pulled over not if you get pulled mm -hmm. over when you get pulled over put your hands, hands on, on the steering wheel, wheel. Yep. roll down the window be it's be it's super courteous because your life is in danger basically. could be could be well it's i mean that's the assumption yeah that's so now but yeah there, there was an assumption that there would always be that and, but I, I would say, I'd give that same talk to my kids. I would say, save the <laughs> <Yeah. any gun. laughs> You know? Yes. Put your hands on the wheel. The reality is, put your hands on the wheel, speak respectfully, you know? Um, do not do anything that would cause the officer to be at all asks, nervous or. When he asks you a question, yes, sir, no, sir. So it's <clears throat> certainly the, the, that is why, you know, this one made one of the uh, most important civil rights speeches in the United States, it was this quote, that justice roll on like a river righteousness, like a never failing stream. Um, <clears throat> so they're, they're often very familiar, especially as civil rights leaders with the stuff in the, in the Book of the Prophets because of the kinds of sins that were being done. Um, he uh, goes on, uh, just to get a little bit more of this flavor, um, uh, pick up at uh, chapter 6, verse 4, 4 to 7. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp. And like David, invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest of oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile. And the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. So they'll be the first to go into exile. Of course, that came true in 722 BC when. Um, when Israel was conquered and taken away, they became the 10 lost tribes of, of Israel. So it's, it's in the, in this book where he speaks about the destruction of the nation of Israel, but he also at the very end talks about, here's uh, some of the messianic kind of language. At the end of chapter nine, starting uh, with verse 11, in the last chapter, <clears throat> you've got him uh, talking about a day of restoration. So somebody want to read that for us a little bit? Uh, chapter 9, starting with verse 11 to the end of the chapter. In that day I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that fear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter will be the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people Israel they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Okay. And you notice here it's all tied to David. In, in that day I will restore David's fallen tent. And so that would point uh, toward that... Um, uh, kingdom that was going to be established in, in and through the, the line of David. It's all, also interesting that there's a promise of worldwide evangelism in the middle of this. So verse 12, what does it say? And all the nations that bear my name. So he's speaking about more than just the nation of Israel, more than just the nation of Judah. He's speaking about all the nations. That will come under his sway. 
So you've got this really dark, heavy preaching of the law because of the abuses that they have. You've got the proclamation that they're going to be the first ones to go into captivity in the northern kingdom. And uh, yet it ends on a, a note of, of promise. Okay, the next one in your book is Jonah. I, I like his first statement. I guess I never thought about it until I read that statement in the book, which says... Jonah's the only one to whom Jesus compared himself? Yeah. Yeah. Of all the prophets, Jonah is the only one. Remember, he says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be. He's the only one that he compares himself to. Which is just an interesting. And again, what does he point to? And not to a time when God said through Jonah or anybody else during Jonah's time, well, now, Jonah's going to go in the belly of this great fish for three days and three nights, and that's going to be a picture of what the Messiah is going to do for you. Right? That would be a rectilinear prophecy. That would be saying, this event is going to point to that event. But instead, it's just a type. And it's one of the types that Jesus points to. It's the only place where he compares himself to um, one of the prophets. And... Well, we would assume just because it was, what else would he point to for the length of time he's going to be between his crucifixion and resurrection? And yet they thinking, you know, he died on Friday, day one, Saturday. Yep. He rose on Sunday. Yep. So it's the third day okay. considered... Yes. The answer is yes. So here's the way, and, and, and where this really messed up a lot of Old Testament scholars early on was when you when you take the years that it says each king has ruled, and you add them all together, you get too many years for the whole time period. And and what the key that unlocked the understanding for them was this that. If a king serves in a part of a year, it's considered he served the whole year. So think about presidents of the United States. How, how long is their term? We say it's four years. four years. But if you're using the way that they counter it, when are they installed? On January 20th. When are they done? On January 19th of the next year. But they've served 19 days as president in that year. And so if you were writing it the way that the they reckon it in, in uh, the Old Testament, you would say the presidential, uh, you know, like you'd say, well, President Trump served for five years. And you'd say, well, wait a minute, I know that's only four. Right? It's kind of like a vacation. You might have a right. three-day vacation, three days, two nights. And then the other thing you have to realize is that their days and nights are also different than ours. So when does their day start? It starts at sundown and then continues till the next sundown. So if he dies on Friday and they want to get him off the cross because they have to get him off before the Sabbath starts, the Sabbath starts at sundown, so he's going to get down, they're going to get him down on, on Friday before that, right? Then that counts one. Then he's there all of Saturday, from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, that's another day. And then from Saturday sundown until he rises on Easter morning, that's counted as another day. Which is why it says, and any part of a day is considered the whole day. It does say on the third day. It on the third say at the end of the third day, it says on the third day. So, no, so this is, this is just a typical prophecy. And you wouldn't know it was a typical prophecy, except that Jesus tells you it is. Right? Because there's no place else in the Bible where it says, there's no place where the gospel writers say, or the rabbis say, or another prophet says, well, gee, what, what happened to Jonah is going to happen to the Messiah. Only Jesus says that. What else is unique about, uh, about Jonah? He was sent. And one of the, the principles of a type is that um, 
uh, the Old Testament type might be different than the New Testament type. So, for instance, uh, Paul talks about Adam as a type of Christ. And you say, well, how is he a type of Christ? Well, he was supposed to obey God's law. God put him um, in a perfect place. And, and um, But what Adam didn't do, Jesus did do. Jesus is the new Adam, Paul says, who fully fulfilled everything the first Adam should have. Now, what did Jonah do when he got the message to away. go? He, he ran. Want, he didn't want to go. Right. That's why I was wondering why he compared himself to Jonah. Well, because he's the better, he's the one who's better than Jonah. He's the one who's better than Adam. He's the prophet who's greater than Moses. He's the prophet who, or the king who's greater than David. David screwed up a lot, but, but there's a better king. And there's a better prophet. And there's a better priest. And there's a better Jonah. When God said to Jonah, go to the you know, wicked people, he said, I don't want to go. And he ran the other way. Jesus said, here am I. I am your servant. I came to do your will. And even though it was tough, he didn't run away. That's the point that, that he would make in that type of saying. And then who did he go to? Well, he went to sinners. And, and he went not just to... God's people, he went to non-Jews. Which means the message of repentance and forgiveness is not just for the Jews, but it's for for everyone. So Jonah is a type of Jesus, but Jesus is the one better than Jonah. I don't know, because the Bible doesn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice story. I mean, yeah, would, I mean, the Jewish people view Jonah it, as it's curious. one of the stories of our history, or do they view it with uh, some sense of purpose beyond being a story of history? Or? I was just wondering if this book had anything about it, so I'll just see if there's anything about Jonah here. There's a thing on Luther on Jonah. <laughs> No, sometimes in this book he'll have the rabbinic view about, but he does not have anything on Jonah in this one. This is a Jewish red line. He does have our next one, which is Micah. And that's one, of course, is quoted in the New Testament as, as well. Especially Micah chapter 5. Well, it could be an example of um, being forgiving to other people. Yeah, it, so th this is one of the questions that I guess I would have for the Jews is why they don't have the kind of care for the Gentiles that the Old Testament displays in a book like Jonah and also in a book like Isaiah, which stresses that Israel is to be a light for all nations, for not just Jews, but for Gentiles as well. And in the book of Ezekiel, when it talks about leaders, he says, I'm going to call leaders from the nations. What do you got there? I said, Lori's right. It says in Judaism, the story of Jonah represents the teaching of Teshuvah, which is the ability to repent and be forgiven by God. Yeah. But it's not about evangelism and reaching out to others. Now, Micah, uh, if you turn to Micah, uh, he's uh, taking shots at both places. <laughs> okay. The Lord's coming, but um, if you've got uh, NIV, the first title says Judgment Against Samaria and Jerusalem. And, uh, and he's taking shots at both places. He hits Samaria hard at the very beginning. And he tells them that trouble is going to come, that there's going to be a disaster that's going to come to the land. He, uh, 
rebukes the leaders, but just before he does that, there's also, besides the word of judgment, so he can say, for instance, um, in chapter uh, 2, verse 3, therefore the Lord says, I'm planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly, for it will be a time of calamity. In that day, men will ridicule you. They'll taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possession is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our fields to traitors. So it's going to go to other people. Therefore, you have no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the to find the land by lot. Now, in the middle of, again, and with all the prophets, there's both judgment and that promise. So then if you turn to chapter, the end of chapter 2, starting at verse 12, you've got a promise of what God's going to do. Somebody want to read verses 12 and 13 for us there? Of which chapter? Two. Chapter 2. Oh, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like flock in its pastures, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through and pass the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. So he says, I'm going to gather a remnant again. I'm going to bring together again the image of sheep and pen, and God being the shepherd who's going to lead them. And then... Um, uh, and then he really gets on the leaders in chapter 3, uh, and he speaks some really strong words against them. Somebody want to read verses 1 to 3? Then I said, listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice, who you, you who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people, and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin, and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. Now this sounds a lot like Ezekiel, where God takes the people to task for, you know, abusing the sheep, taking advantage of the sheep, skinning the sheep for their own good, using the sheep for their own good, and to remember this is that sheep shepherd image of, of leadership. And, and so he's uh, taking them to task because they are not doing what they're supposed to do. So the leaders are not doing what they're supposed to do. So God's going to bring a new leader. And that's where chapter 5 comes in. Um, especially chapter 5 verses 1 to 4, the promise of the Messiah. Somebody want to read those verses for us? Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel and the chief. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the lands of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall govern, give them up until the time when she who is in labor is given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. No, that's it. So that's the promise. Where is he going to come from? Bethlehem. Which is the city of? David. David, so it points to his earthly origins. But then it says, his origins are from of old, from ancient times. Uh, the NASB has translated there, the day, from days of eternity. And so this is another place where it tells us not only where he's going to come from, and he's fulfilling the Davidic promise, but also that he would be not just a man, but he's been around since eternity. So again, uh, kind of reflecting Paul's uh, introduction to the Romans, who says, who as to his flesh is uh, 
you know, somebody connected to David, but declared to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. So it's a passage that builds on the Isaiah 7 passage that he's going to be both human and divine. Um, and the other passages in Isaiah that say he's going to be the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And that he would be a shepherd, now again, well, you, you read that in the context of Psalm 23, in the context of Ezekiel, where God says he's going to raise up his own person to shepherd the flock. And here he says he'll stand and shepherd again. This is a common theme. So if, if you're thinking in the New Testament, when Jesus stands up and says, I'm the good shepherd, they've got all of this in their minds and hearts. That's a, a passage that's just rich with imagery from the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah. Um, just a little bit more detail about um, the case that he has against Israel. Um, he doesn't like their sacrifices. That's in chapter 6. In chapter 7, I mean, chapter 6 yet, he says, shall I, this is verse 11, shall I quit a man with dishonest scales with a bag of false weights? Her rich men are violent, her people are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. So they're, again, misusing people for their own good. And yet at the end, He's got this word of promise. If you turn to chapter uh, uh, 7, verse 14, somebody want to read verses 14 and 15? Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, which lives by itself in a forest, in fertile pasture lands. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in days long ago. As in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them my wonders. So he promises that he's going to shepherd them again. And then there's this wonderful um, conclusion that points to the mercy and grace of God. Um, especially in verses 18 uh, to 20. Somebody want to read those verses for us of, of Micah, of chapter 7. Who is a God like you, hardening iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant? He does not retain his anger forever, because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread out our tread our iniquities on your foot. He will cast all, cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers. And so once again, it ends on a, on a, a note of promise, of forgiveness, of grace. Um, and I should say the other probably most uh, famous passage of Micah besides the promise about Bethlehem is, uh, uh, the, is verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So he said, here's what you're not doing, here's what he does require of you. All right, in the interest of time, we'll just kind of gloss over the, the last three. Could I ask you to, sure. to, to just clarify, in the beginning you said Micah takes shots at both of... Israel and... Samaria? And, and, yeah, uh, well, no, Israel and, and Judah, Samaria and Judah. Samaria would be Israel. So usually they called, the northern tribes um, are often designated as Israel or Samaria, but usually Israel. And, uh, and the, other, the southern tribes are, are uh, named Judah. Okay. And they're the ten, ten tribes in the north. Um, if you notice in the one book, it, it really said, well, the, the descendants of, J of Josh, uh, not of Jacob, um, of Joseph. He was really, uh, well, who were the, which tribes were from Joseph? There were his two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, okay? 
and they were in the northern kingdom. So when he's talking about the tribes of Joseph, he's talking about the northern kingdom. But it, when you look at the beginning of this, um, this particular prophecy, he's, he's taking shots at both of them. Um, and he asks, where, where is it? I didn't make a point of it, but if you look at Micah 1, verse 5, he's taking the task, both of them. He says, all this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the house of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? In other words, he says, this stuff is happening in your two worship centers. You remember in Israel, the... Um, the uh, worship center was Mount Gerizim, which is uh, made reference to that, showed you that on the map when we were looking at the woman at the well. That's right near Sychar, Mount Gerizim. And that's why she said, we worship on this mountain, but you Jews worship in Jerusalem. And that's when Jesus says, well, there's going to come a time when it won't matter where you worship because you're all going to worship in spirit and in truth. But Mount Gerizim is the, is the mountain where when the Israelites first came to the promised land that they set up a temple. And then it was moved to Jerusalem. And so when the kingdom divided, uh, while up until that time, that division they were worshiping in Jerusalem, Mount Gerizim was built as kind of a, oh, well, you got Jerusalem, we're going to have our own temple now. Pastor? Yeah? Question for you. When you mentioned like the ten tribes. Yep. Uh, were they friendly as a group, or were they confrontational among each other? Well, they were united as a group under the the king who descended from so The southern kingdom was the kings that descended from David, and the northern kingdom eventually are called the ten lost tribes of Israel because they pretty much got wiped out. Mm. But there was always a remnant who um, lived in the land. So the last few books that your, your book covers, um, our, our book covers, is um, Habakkuk. Um, and uh, these are words. Yep, Habakkuk, the just will live by faith. Where'd you hear that? Romans chapter one. And the point is, is that whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, what saves you is not what you do, but it's what God does for you. You know, and anybody who, who, who looks at when God gives the law in the Old Testament can see that. So God creates Adam, gives them life, Adam and Eve gives them life, and then says, and we heard it in the Old Testament lesson this morning, now you go be fruitful and multiply, rule over the... He tells them what to do after he's already given them everything. When, when God gives them the Ten Commandments and the rest of the laws on Sinai, does he give it to Moses and say, okay, Moses, take it into the land of Egypt and tell the Israelites when they get eight out of ten of these commandments, right, I'll come get them, <laughs> right? It's just the opposite. He goes and gets them, and, and then God says, bring them back to this mountain and when you read the introduction to the Ten Commandments, which we never have to memorize, I wish we did, he begins by saying, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, don't have any other gods before me. In other words, I have blessed you. Now what you do is going to be a response to my, my blessing, my gift. When God gives the law, it's always for us to know how to respond to him. Um, my favorite, uh, probably, book imagery that way is the five love languages. You know, what does it look like to love somebody? Well, you gotta ask that person. What feels like love to you? Do you like gifts? You know? Do you need a lot of affirming words? What feels like love to you? Do you need to hold hands all the time? You know? What feels like love to you? Because if I don't know what feels like love to you, I can say, well, I love you. I can do things that I think maybe will show that I love you. 
But if I'm not doing it in the way that you feel it or know it, you're, you're not going to know my love. And, and God says, this is my love language. Don't put any other gods before me. You know, honor my name. Flowers. Spend time with me. <laughs> That's Sabbath day. Respect the life that I've given to you and to those people who are around you. Respect the gift of marriage as a blessing to you and the people around you. Respect the way that I've divvied up the property and don't be jealous of what somebody else has. Or, and respect other people's reputations or names. Don't deride them, don't slander them, don't pull them down. Don't bear false witness against them. Guard your heart, don't covet. And, and God just says, if you want to show me what that you love me, these are the ways you do it. And that's why so often in the New Testament it says, if you love me, what's the, what's the next? Obey my commands. You obey my commands. The way you show God that you love him is by doing what he asks you to do. Not something that he necessarily doesn't ask you to do. So that's the back. The just are going to live by faith. And, uh, and Romans 1 is one of the places you'll see it quoted. Um, Zephaniah uh, prophesied, as he says here, against Judah's leadership, so he's in the southern kingdom. And he says to them, uh, and it's this big thing about righteousness, you have to be righteous. And, of course, we hit that kind of in the Romans 1 chapter, because where do we get our righteousness from? It's a gift. It's a gift that comes through the grace and mercy of God. So those are the first of the minor prophets, the pre-exile ones. And then, of course, people go into exile. Israel in 722, Judah in 589. And then uh, the others are when they're on their way back from that Kibbutz uh, and there's some great prophecies of the Messiah there, too. Let's close here with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that uh, whether it's the type of Jonah or whether it's the direct prophecy of a new shepherd coming from Bethlehem, a shepherd king, uh, you uh, were laying the groundwork for your son to come into this world so that when he came, uh, people might recognize him, understand him, and see him as the Messiah. And we know there's all kinds of things that make us blind to the truth and promise of your word, and we just ask that you continue to open our eyes so that we can see him more clearly, love him more deeply, and respond um, with our trust in you and our obedience to your will and way. In his name, amen. Pastor, do you think how part of the reason that the Jews don't accept all these things is because of all this yelling at them that the prophets did?